Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have... Simon Wood. Yes, we so, do. Yeah. He was so, he, so interesting. What a yes. great interview, you guys. Yeah, he's got really interesting stories about how he came to writing and got into publishing and transitioned into writing ebooks and indie publishing. Yep. And um, now he uh, writes for an Amazon imprint. So we talked to him a little bit about how that came to be. And yep. he writes mystery, thriller, and horror. And yes. pen names, talked about... Being your own advocate and yes, you know stuff yes. like that. It was just very, very some very good tips and information. So. Yeah, real actual stuff that you know if it's not happening to you today, it may happen to you tomorrow or next week, and and things you can hold on to 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 uh, kind of navigate through some situations that can get kind of sticky. So yeah. really good good information. So what's been going on with you, Sarah? Well, I think we are buying a house. So basically that's like taking over my life. So did an inspection. Wow. And yeah. But not moving too far. Just staying mm-hmm. in Houston. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Sammy doesn't believe me, but it's true. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, I've been working on that a lot. And um, that is really about it. I mean, yeah. that's kind of <laughs> taken everything, taking my life over. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it does. it does. Yeah. yeah. I don't have a lot of news either. Just more this, just doing the normal stuff. Uh, we did do our QA yes. on Tuesday night and that was so super fun. Yes. I just loved it. Uh, we, I don't know how many people we had. I didn't count, but just some really great people and great questions. And um, I, I just really loved it and I'd like to do it again. I yeah. guess I hope I, I'm sure I can wrote Sarah into doing it again, but um, it yeah. was really fun. So. It was a, it was good to see faces and connect yes. with names. Yes. And we talked about questions about everything from like um, like mindset stuff, mm-hmm. and craft, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. marketing. So mm-hmm. um, if you're in the Facebook group, by yep. the time this podcast goes out, uh, the replay will be up in the group. So yes. if you're in the group, you can go in and see it. And we will do it again, I think. Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll pick a different time so yeah. that other people, you know, people in other countries can maybe pop on if they want to. But um, it was great. It was just so fun. I, it's like that's right up my alley. So I loved it. Yeah, <clears throat> I did have a good podcast I wanted to recommend. Oh yeah, um, mm-hmm. Kirsten Oliphant, her um, podcast "Create If Writing." She has one on lessons learned in um, publishing. And then she has another one on, um, on craft. And it's all about, you know, she's writing in, uh, she's kind of broken out. I would say like she has has. with this uh, rom-com kind of sweet rom-com type series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so she talks about um, decisions she made about that. And it was just really good. So I'll put links to that in the show notes. Yeah. 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 Really good stuff. Kirsten was one of our early guests and uh so you can find her episode back at the beginning I don't know what number it is I'm so bad about knowing the numbers to our episodes I don't really it's okay we'll link to it yeah we'll link to it we'll link to it there you go so anyway we should get on with the interview because it's very very good yep so here's Simon all right all right today we're super excited to have Simon Wood with us hi Simon how are you I'm pretty good. How are you doing? We're great. We're so glad you're here. (laughs) So let me read your bio and we'll get started. USA Today bestselling author Simon Wood is a California transplant from England. He's a former competitive race car driver, a licensed pilot, an endurance cyclist, an animal rescuer, and an occasional PI. He shares his world with his American wife, Julie. Their lives are dominated by a long-haired dachshund and six cats. He's an Anthony Award-winning author and a regular contributor to Writer's Digest and other writing magazines. He also writes horror under the pen name of Simon Janus. So, very cool bio. That's one of the coolest ones we've had. Yeah, it really is. I played it down. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I love you. You English are so modest. I love that. <laughs> Tell us how you got into writing, Simon. Um, it was basically when I moved to the US in um, 98. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training and education and everything like that. And um, I was one of those people who suddenly found when you come to the US, all my engineering experience and things didn't count for anything. And I was kind mm-hmm. of like at a loose end. Mm-hmm. Um, I couldn't get a job in my field. And Mm -hmm. so I just had this thing about um, I wanted to turn, have a go at writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have any kind of experience or any real knowledge or anything. I was dyslexic. I didn't do very well in school. And so um, suddenly you're saying, I'm going to try and write. Um, (laughs) It was kind of a a bizarre sort of situation. Mm -hmm. And um, Julie, who's my wife now, um, she had said to me, you know, you can't, you can't write a sentence down. I said, I know, but you can. And she just, I said that, you know, I wanted to write things. And so we went to the library, got some books and she read books out on craft Mm -hmm. because it wasn't until we started that I realized that I was basically functionally, functionally illiterate or non-functionally illiterate mm-hmm. i'm not quite sure what is the right wording for mm-hmm. that but basically mm-hmm. i realized that i didn't understand sentence structure or paragraphs wow. or anything mm-hmm. so i just got a couple of books on craft she would read them out and then i gave a crack at three short stories and we spent three months ed- editing mm-hmm. those three short stories and i wanted to write a book and then um i saw and something on television that gave me my idea and i basically broke down books as like mm-hmm. I went and did like the the reverse engineered um it's very mechanical engineered mind <laughs> way of writing mm-hmm. I went and got books that I wanted on or that I really enjoyed and things that I wanted to write and I listened to them and I wrote down um every scene you know when characters en- entered when characters left when a story line started, when the next one came in, how they got tied up. And then I would examine them. And then I thought, I've now got to do the reverse of this. And I wrote mm. down all the steps that I wanted for my story. And that's how I basically got started. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't quite amazing. sure whether I knew where I was going. Mm-hmm. And um, my wife entered one of the short stories, not the first three that I wrote, but one of the later ones. And the f- the opening of the novel, which wasn't finished at the time, but we had polished the first few chapters, and they placed in a state library mm-hmm. competition um, both the story and the the novel. And we kind of thought, oh, maybe, maybe we're not far off. And they just yeah. carried on, and just mm-hmm. basically just kept writing and kept learning as I went. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. I didn't know that. And how supportive of your wife to yeah. just like. Um, I'm lucky in that she out. she has the right kind of critical mind to mm-hmm. be able to pick things apart and make me um, put them back together again. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, it's kind of worked in that sort of sense. But I, you know, it is luck. I don't think I would have ever had anything published um, at that without point her. without her. To be oh, honest, oh, that's nice. Now, how involved is she now? She still is. I mean, she's still the primary reader. Nothing Mm -hmm. goes out to anybody without her reading, because I don't know if I've translated in my head Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. paper is is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Yeah. I thought that was interesting how you said it was a mechanical engineering way of writing that like you took it apart and basically figured out the components and then, Applied it to your story. I think that's a very good description of. Well, it, it, the thing is, that I always, I actually now it ended up being becoming a part a thing for Writers Digest. I wrote about this, mm-hmm. and then it became a, a, a seminar and a workshop because of the way I I do it. But partly the big thing I always try and get over to people is understand story. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter mm-hmm. what it is, whether you're writing romance, you know, horror, mm-hmm. mystery. Um, straight fiction, whatever it is, is to just basically analyze story, understand how story goes together. And then it becomes a lot easier Mm -hmm. um, 
to to create your own stories because you're like go oh I, I can see how things need to be um brought together and tied up and you know made interesting mm-hmm. um so that i and that just appeals to my mindset but i try to get uh student writers to always just just go get, get half a dozen books yeah. break them down yeah. and then when you've done that go and get another half dozen mm-hmm. and just keep <laughs> doing it because mm-hmm. it, it it becomes second nature to how to, you know, someone throws you an idea and you can put a story together in, you know, the framework of a story in about half an hour or so. Yeah. So do you run those workshops, seminar things now or? Yeah, I do them mm-hmm. for um, sometimes for um, Sisters in Crime. I okay. I do them online. I started doing them online during the pandemic yeah. uh, through my website and stuff. Okay. But um, it's always prove popular everybody laughs because i have a a spreadsheet that um illustrate that i break my story into a one-page thing everything is on a one-page spreadsheet and everybody laughs but then everybody goes oh actually i'll give that a go yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome that is great what is your definition of success and has it changed over your writing career do you think um i think the main thing is, is basically building upon a foundation everything that I do next I want it to be um and incrementally a little bit better than the 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 thing before Mm -hmm. um because to be honest I don't know where this is gonna go Mm -hmm. even after 20 years you know it's that thing of like uh you know, at the beginning, you're kind of like going, well, I don't know if I'm just sort of like shouting into the wind here with what I'm doing. And you're like going, I'll be pleased if I just get one thing published. And you're like mm-hmm. going, well, two would be really nice. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, let's let's make it five. I'd like to get yeah. a bestsellers list. Yeah. And, you know, and you kind of keep it's moving gross. the goalpost mm-hmm. yeah. and you'll, because you have to keep doing that. So I don't know. Um success is that sort of like undiscovered country that I'll never find because I'll never decide on what that actually is. Mm-hmm, so, yeah. um, but at this point it is just trying to do a little bit better than the, the piece before. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And that's realistic too. You know, I mean, I think having, I mean, we all have giant goals, but just that yeah, yeah. wanting to do better than you did last time. I just, I think that's so that's so but the main thing is because you can lose your readership so right. easily you right. can be that one you know and it's not like you've gone you've gone out your way to sort of shank it it'd be just that thing of like someone can react to the story you don't really know what people are going to think of it until they've got it and it's all too late then right and so yeah. you kind of rely on the kindness of strangers that they'll mm-hmm. keep on liking you mm-hmm. and that enough of them will keep on liking you and it's that thing of you just don't you know, you kind of like going, well, hopefully I'll please enough people this time around again kind of thing. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, true. What do you wish you'd known about writing in craft? I mean, you told us a little bit about how you started, but what do you wish you'd known looking back on that now? Um, I don't know. I think at the beginning it was it was such a thing of like, I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the main thing was not to, if I could, do it all over again I think it was not to be embarrassed Mm -hmm. about it I mean I just took it you know I kind of think there was a lot of like imposter syndrome and kind of um, fear of like going well what if I look like an idiot Mm -hmm. and so that kind of held me back and you kind of like going well I'll aim low because Mm -hmm. then you know no one will notice if I and that and I think that came from like being in school and not being very good in in school it was that thing like not looking like the class idiot and I think that kind of carried through and I think if I'd been a bit more courageous at the beginning and reached out for outside help because I didn't take a writing class I didn't join any groups I didn't understand how you know the publishing world worked because I was kind of like trying to hide behind something of like well I don't want anybody to see anything (laughs) Uh, and I exactly. think that was probably the one thing that I had done is to learn from others mm-hmm. rather than to sort of like, um, 
you know, it was good what I did by myself, but there is that thing of like when I first did, I didn't actually talk to anybody about writing until my first book came out. Mm. And then I went, now I'll go and join a group because I got kind of a credential. Right. And then you walk into the room and, and a lot of people were learning, you know, without Just like that. you had been, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And you're like, mm-hmm. oh, well, maybe I shouldn't have been so kind of embarrassed yeah. Yeah. To, to not do that. So I think it would have been to be more outgoing, I think. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. great because I know that for me, I did sort of did the same thing, but I wasn't embarrassed because I knew I didn't know anything and I was older too. So it was sort of like, okay, just teach me. I don't know. I'm going to look like an idiot, which I did, but it was such a great boot camp kind of situation for me that I'm, I'm so grateful for it. So, yeah. 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 I also learned better with other people as opposed yeah. to myself. Yeah. Yeah, I'd remember when I first started trying to write, there was like this big, um, I felt like it was a big conundrum for me when people would say, what do you do? And I, I, I was like, well, am I a writer? And I didn't feel like I'd call myself an author because I felt like that was somebody special and different. And I hadn't quite achieved that marker yet. And then, you know, eventually, I think the longer I did it, the more I felt more comfortable with that definition. But I remember feeling the same way. And I think everybody feels this way about like the imposter syndrome struggle. I think that's very, very real. I think I still do. I still sort of say, I write. I don't, I don't like saying, oh, I'm a writer or whatever. <laughs> um, you know, because it still feels like, yeah, you still yeah. have to take the trash out on Monday nights. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So and true. I can't say rider because people think I'm saying rider and they think I'm in a motorcycle gang. I <laughs> promise you that has happened more than once. <laughs> so I have to say author, but still it's, <laughs> it's the That's same so, thing. Yeah. Well, what about marketing? Do you, what do you wish you'd known about marketing? Um, I think the main thing I, that I kind of built on probably in the last 10 years or so um when certain things happened and, and what have you I kind of realized that I needed to build a community mm-hmm. I don't think mm-hmm. you can do the hard sell I think yeah. you can do the hard sell once mm-hmm. right of I you know I've done enough events with people where it's always that thing of um um buy my book buy my book and it doesn't matter what the question is it'll be like speaking of the color blue my book has the color blue <laughs> and, you know and it's that thing of like you can't be on all the time right, and right, i've seen right. authors um you know do that and that, and it's worked for one book it's become very successful for them to just you know always be messaging the sort of like hard sell mm-hmm. late night infomercial regardless of the situation or the you know, or anything else. And it kind of works, but I think when they try and return with the the second one, I don't think people have got the patience for it or will give you the the time for that. So it's kind of that thing of like, I've got to try and build this group of supporters who will, you know, that I can keep adding to Mm -hmm. and have something in common with them. And I, I kind of always gone with this thing of like, um, I usually have like, 10 things about me. What am I? You know, it's, you know, I'm a, uh, an expat, you know, um, I'm, a you know, a cyclist, uh, you know, and triathlons and things like this. And you suddenly realize those are the different groups that you have some sort of commonality with mm-hmm. and that you can bring people in. Because if you just say everybody's a reader, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, well, everybody's a reader. You can't get everybody. You've got to pick um where, what your community is right. and it's that thing of you know a collection of people who've got um random interests or some crossover but they're all various shades of you right and I think that was something I didn't realize I think at the beginning I think like everybody it's that thing of like I've got to find readers whatever mm-hmm. they are I don't care what mm-hmm. they are and you've got and trying to go for everybody you find nobody Right, right. And I think it's that thing of you just start with, you know, friends and neighbors and, it, you know, you just keep building these rings mm-hmm. that um, you can find a group. Um, and I think the other thing really is, is having a point of view is that if you are trying to um, market, it's that thing to, 
have something you know are you the funny guy are you the um the expert are you the contrarian whatever it is you need to have that that somebody mm-hmm. can latch on to and they go oh that guy oh he's the baseball guy yeah. and mm-hmm. and that helps because then people can find you um if you try and be somewhat uh, transparent and not have yeah. anything that um that is identifiable about you i think um you know that's the kind of thing that you need to give yourself mm-hmm. um and i you know it's another there's actually another thing i used to do a seminar on and i say it's like you know if that's your thing if this is what your books are about and you're trying to identify with it you know that's how you need to present yourself even to you know depend on what it is you may even want to dress like that Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean costume, but something that's in <laughs> keeping with you know the imagery um of of who you are. It's like Charles Todd. He's, mm-hmm. he's very much a southern gentleman and he kind of presents himself as a southern gentleman. Right. You know, I've never seen the guy not in a suit and tie, mm-hmm. yeah. regardless of the situation. And it's just that thing of like, well, how do I want to present myself to the um to the world? I think one of the worst things writers are is we're invisible. If we're like, if this was music, yeah, we'd be out there. If it was film yeah. or television, yeah. we'd be out there. But as writers, we're kind of invisible, mm-hmm. you know. And and I think one of the things that you know we should do as an as an industry is to try to be more visible. Yeah, um, yeah. That reminds me of um, Gail Carriger. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she has a very distinctive writing style Mm -hmm. and her personality matches that. And when she's in conferences and stuff, she dresses a certain way. And so it conveys, you know, her, her brand basically. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, for some people and Gail is probably just genuinely that way, but for some people it's a persona, but you know, a persona can help you battle imposter syndrome because Yeah, yeah, yeah. You place, you put on that whatever it is, or you take, and then you you become that person until you can be that person. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I, like I, the goal I, is that it becomes genuine and part of who you are. But until you get there, you keep kind of putting this on. Yeah, the careful thing you've got to be about persona is that it's not fake. It's right. got to be, exactly. if you like, the more confident mm-hmm. version of you <laughs> yeah. rather than, you know, you're playing a character. Correct. Right. Because right. that yeah. that can, you know, people do see through that. And right. then you you kind of get into, even with this um, Alex Jones kind of thing, of like mm-hmm. when he's tried to use it as a defense, well, it's like, it's just an act. And it's like, well, a lot of people bought into that act. Yeah. And have, yeah. No, have it acted has to be genuine. You yeah. <laughs> so you can't, you can't make your persona too divorced from who you are. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The other thing I thought that was interesting about, like, even the list in your bio of all the things that you've done, it, it does give p- different people things to latch onto about you and go, oh, I like to cycle. And, you know, yeah. it gives, but no, none of those were about writing. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I think we need to find other hobbies and interest and things that we can use to pull people to us. Yeah, because I mean, you, you're you're a writer, but you're more than that. Or hopefully, yeah. you are. You're not just a, you know, <laughs> one dimension. Yeah. <laughs> Healthier <laughs> if you are. <laughs> so, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career, and then looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? I this was one of the questions that I kind of thought about, and I thought I'm not sure I had <laughs> any assumptions because it was <laughs> such a it was such a different world. Mm-hmm. Um, from what I did, you know, I used to design mm-hmm. things that stopped oil rigs blowing up, mm-hmm. or or made drinking water safe to drink, mm-hmm. and you know that was my background. So you're kind of literally like wide eyed and going, uh, I have no idea how any of this mm-hmm. works. Yeah. Um, what should I be doing? Mm-hmm. And so I don't think I I had any um any real sort of um you know, any kind of real assumption about what or any perception of what writing would be. Cause I, you know, part of that was that sort of like um, pro- self-protection mechanism. Like, well, this is mm-hmm. never going to go anywhere. Right. And right. so right. You, you don't know. And it was that thing of, of um, that I did try to set out 
to like, I know nothing about this, so I need yeah. to learn about it. Even, you know, not just sort of like how to format a manuscript, but, you know, that thing of like, how do books get into bookstores? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how does a book end up at the front of the store? How do I get a face out or an end cap? Right. And you, and mm-hmm. I, you know, you would just go and if anyone was willing to talk about it, I would go and learn about it from them. And you're like, going, oh, so that's why this is how mm-hmm. this works. Yeah. And you kind of learn about this isn't going to be as easy as, um, you know, that I'm going to end up on the bestsellers list after, yeah. you know, my yeah. first book, you know, yeah. and it's that thing of like, you're not going to get there without a, a bunch of other things being set in motion that are nothing to do with you. It's going to be, you know, publisher driven kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't think I came in with any kind of um, sort of solid understanding of, of what publishing was going to be. Mm-hmm. And that may be good. That may be a yeah. good way to approach it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did one thing, I suppose it's one of those things that I always, um, you know, whether I'm, if I'm doing, you know, like, like an anthology or something, you're reading stories or, or you're doing like a competition judging thing, it's always frustrating. And you want to say to them, don't do this, which is the lead character's an author. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's that thing of like, um, it's always dinner at the Four Seasons and they're meeting their publisher. And it's like, you know, I've had, I've had like 20 plus yeah. publishers over the years. And I think I've only ever met four. Mm-hmm. you know and it's mm-hmm. and I think I've only been taken out to dinner twice yeah. <laughs> and it's that thing of like your agent is not this person who's going to be your um um sort of like, personal manager guru and and thing like that it's like none of this stuff is you know and you see people have these sort of like you know those dreams and aspirations will come out in a story and you're like going it's just not right not like that realistic no. um no, your agent's not calling saying, have you finished chapter five yet? You know, they're yeah. not that involved. You know, <laughs> they're just like, they yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, some people that is maybe true, but, you know, f- but for, you know, 99.9% of people, you know, that's not their uh, publishing story or their writing life kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah. Yet again, we cannot trust. Hollywood or (laughs) (laughs) the big bestsellers to tell us the truth. (laughs) So have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Um, I have made a ton of mistakes that I kind of regret. Um, The only thing that I would say is I wanted to twist that question a little bit and just, and say there was a time when I've, that I kind of said, I've got to make a very, very um, difficult decision and you don't know whether it's right or wrong, but Mm -hmm. the payoff on the upside, which I never foresaw was massive. And Mm -hmm. every day that decision has, you know, I kind of like look back and go, Oh, if I had not done that, this would not have, we would not be here today. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what it was, was um, it was when I was, um, had a contract with Dorchester Publishing, mm-hmm. and um, and I was doing I think my fourth book with them, and I was doing a book tour, and it was it, and I and from it I knew something was wrong. Mm-hmm. It was when the the credit crunch was happening, and yeah. all the bookstores and everything was kind of crashing, and um, I was getting to bookstores and there was no books, mm-hmm. and I was like going, "Where's there, why is there no books?" And I kind of like sort of like my one of my things is make friends with everybody Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in in, at the publishing house uh, from Mm -hmm. from um the warehouse up to the you know your editor and i basically found out that they owed so much to all the distributors that the um ingram was holding all the books and was not releasing them to the stores until they paid and then there wasn't going to be any pay and they kind of started saying you know we're not, we're going bust, but we're not going bust. And it was kind of a thing. And I spent um, six months breaking their contract down. Mm-hmm. Oh. And, you know, and I kept saying, you know, I need to get out of this. I've been in, I've already had, had some past sort of things of publishers going out of business, small press ones at the beginning and having rights locked up. Right. And I kind of just kept, I was using their public statements in Publishers Weekly mm-hmm. and using them against them in their contract. 
Uh-huh. And just basically whittling away. And, you know, they were laying off staff left and right. Like my editor had gone and I was basically working with the the guy at the top. And then I just walked around. And then in the end they said, and I said, I need my rights back. I said, my contract says mass paperback and you're never publishing that again. So technically we're out of print. And I kept mm-hmm. pushing this and pushing this and pushing this. And it went on for about six months. And in the end they said, um, um, okay, you can have your rights back. Just go away. Just, Just go yeah, away. I mean, yeah. but I did it. Other people <laughs> but I think that's getting, great, yeah. Yeah, other people were getting lawyers. Other people were going oh, to no. sort of like the trade press and making mm-hmm. comments, and it was kind of blowing up. And in the end, I happened to be, and they said, we, we'll give it to you, but we want the ebook rights um, returned in another 12 months. And I said, no, it's, it's all, and it's now. And the part of the reason was there was this tiny little clause in the contract that meant nothing because it's pre ebook, but it was something to do with like $500 of royalties earned electronically meant the book was in, in print forever. So I was oh. trying to prevent mm. that yeah. being triggered. Yes. Yeah. So um, I ended up and they said, we're going to give you a rights back. And then um, I happened to be in New York and I just walked into the publisher and said, I'm here to collect the reversion paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> and and because I was getting the, the run around on the phone, but I was really friendly with the lady on reception who'd become mm-hmm. an editor, and she said he's here, and I went okay, see you in ten, and <laughs> um, I walked in, got to see him. They handed me the paperwork, nice, and that ended up. I took that, I put that into eBooks, mm-hmm. and this was like basically two thousand. Um, nine, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I came up with an ad campaign. I repackaged everything, relaunched everything. Um, at the time, it was a little wild west mm-hmm. when ebooks were starting, and you kind of could make some traction because publishers, mainstream publishing, didn't want to know. Right. And within six months, I had sold two hundred and fifty thousand copies. Oh my gosh, that's um, amazing! That, then the phone rang because I'd I'd lost. Um, a ghostwriting contract mm-hmm. as well as obviously the my mainstream contract with Dorchester and then it was like going this is going uh, going, and then the phone started ringing of like well can we buy rights and that led to um, an eight book contract with um, Amazon yeah, and, with an Amazon imprint right yeah and then with um, Crazy. you know with all the audiobook rights and and everything started to snowball off of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you kind of went, I that decision, that thing of like going, I'm gonna, I can not gonna let it be in someone else's hands. Mm-hmm. I've got to um best serve myself in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was that being aware of it because I like I say I'd screwed up enough times before then that you know I've made mistakes, mm-hmm. made poor decisions, or or been naive. And it's like I can't with this, but I did not. I didn't realize that you know that subsequently has probably led to um, it's probably led to like almost two million copies in print, audio, e whatever, yeah. and yeah. foreign rights being sold over the last ten years. Yeah. And it all comes down. And I, every day I think about. You know, if I had not stepped in and taken, you know, a plan of wearing them down, breaking down their arguments and mm-hmm. and backing everything up, I don't think I would have um, managed to have yeah. got no. what I wanted. And if yeah. you'd gone the, the litigation route, I mean, you could still be litigating that. I mean- yeah, I mean, I the thing that I had there was, you know, I had this very frank talk with the guy who was essentially the last man, last man standing at the at the the publishing house and it was kind of this thing of like, he goes, well, anybody's coming at me with um, lawyers and stuff. He's going, I'm going to push back. And I, mm-hmm. cause we'd, we got into the thing of like, he goes, he just sort of said, he goes, I just like the way you did this. There he goes, you, go. you just kept, you know, he goes, you basically kept presenting the situation. And he goes, and then I just thought at this point, I, you know, he goes, I don't know how long we're going to be in business. He goes, I don't know. They tried to auction the company and it had gone nowhere. And that was the other thing of like, I don't want to be bought and yeah. sold. And then no, the only thing that they had said was you have to give up because I couldn't get a royalty statement. I knew I was owed money and I couldn't get a royalty yeah. statement. And, and I said, um, you know, they said, you give up your, your 
any money that's owed. If you sign this, you'll give up any money you're owed. <laughs> and it was like the the commodity of those rights was worth a lot more than yes. what was probably a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, but I, it, you're so smart to have seen that, though, because I don't know that everybody sees that, that yeah. the value of those rights is so and, much and, more. And they speak, you know, it was, it was one of the mistakes I made right at the beginning. It was one of those things of um, I managed on, a, on the first contract to get it for U.S. only, mm. mass paperback, one-time you know, right. That was the only thing they had, North American. Yeah. And and I and I, I managed to get all the other things knocked off. And then I felt bad for doing that and then said, oh no, you can have world rights. <laughs> oh no. And I'd had I'd had a publisher in the UK want the rights, but they said they wanted them sort of like not, you know, secondary. Mm-hmm. They wanted primary UK rights and stuff and all this sort of stuff. And so I had made that mistake of like yeah. and you suddenly realize how much your rights are, you know, are worth secondary rights. They have, you know, value, even though if you can't, or even though you can't put a dollar figure on it, but to just give everything away. Yeah. And so I am a real sort of like rights raptor. I kind of do, <laughs> I do push back on, on everything. I've got everything written down of when things yeah. um, uh, end of like, terms or whatever mm. or trying to put explosion clauses in to sort of make sure that something can't be tied up forever yeah, yeah. it's so smart and mm-hmm. i knew that you were early to the ebook kind of indie scene but i have not ho- heard the whole backstory so yeah it was that. just it's just the fact that i got those four back books back i would held off for a long time for a good year be- before getting involved and it was a f- I realized I had the e-rights to 12 books and I basically just um, said, well, let, you know, I don't have a day job anymore. Yeah. I've lost all my contracts. <laughs> I've got to do something. And it yeah. was the thing of like, I, this is, I'm willing to sort of like put, I think it was like two or $3,000 into this to mm-hmm. see if this yeah. works. I paid for advertising. I had, had a whole campaign. I tried to launch 12 books at once and realized that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It's like pick a tip of the spear, pick one <laughs> yeah. and work with it. And and, yeah. I, and then it's that thing of like when that one starts to lose its, its um, energy, you bring another one in, but you right. just keep moving one to the front and mm-hmm. had this whole one year um, campaign of advertising, promotion, um, outreach and things like that. And then it was one of those, the only scary thing is when you suddenly see it's no, when the numbers started like ramping up and ramping up and all of a sudden it was that thing like, I'm not driving this anymore. It's going mm-hmm. wherever it wants to go. And, and that's a little bit worrying because it's like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to make it go quick and I don't know how to slow it down. Right. Right. So it's that, a good that's, problem to have. It's yeah, a that good is problem a good to have. <laughs> but you know, it, but even that went sideways at one point when you start getting some blowback on things, and you're just like, "Well, how am I going to handle that now?" Right. And for some yeah. books, it took you know like 18 months to get the the readership back because mm-hmm. something goes sideways on you with that you hadn't you know foreseen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, what about the opposite? Have you ever had something that you thought was a home run? Uh, and it turned out not to be? Yeah, I think at the beginning, I kind of had this idea of like, I like flawed heroes. I like mm-hmm. someone who's who's kind of like screwed up and is mm-hmm. like on a road to redemption. And I found that that really worked against me. Mm-hmm. It's I don't mean to be horrible, but the especially the US market is very moralistic. Mm-hmm. about oh, yeah. what it reads and what it likes mm-hmm. and so you know my first book the you know that was published but you know it's heavily changed and some a lot of it before it even saw editors because I started to get some um, feedback that you know I kind of had this thing of like my first book is accidents waiting to happen and it's about a guy where things all come back you know, come home to roost for him. You know, it's the thing of an affair. It's to do with how he's, he paid somebody off. He had taken a backhand. And this is all before page one. Yes. It's got, there's none of this is in the book, but mm-hmm. you just know this is what he had done. And now it's, 
you know, he suddenly mm-hmm. finds himself in this sort of like um, weird sort of like uh, north by northwest world where it's all going going sideways for him. You know, people want to kill him. He doesn't know why. You know, he everything, all his worst nightmares all, all start landing on mm-hmm. page one for him. And he doesn't know what direction it's come from because he's screwed up so much. Mm-hmm. And um, people just could not get past the infidelity, although mm-hmm. it's not in the book. Isn't that funny? Um, I had um, first time I ever did a reader's group, um, someone just tore into me. But actually, the woman who ran the group um, just tore oh. into me and said, um, so how many affairs have you had? Oh, oh my. Um, and and I went and I kind of like was a little bit thrown because you yeah. you know you kind yeah. of get your little sort of like you're ready with your put downs and things as, yeah. as, you know <laughs> and how to handle rough and that situations. came out of nowhere yeah and you're like going wow and I kind of a funny thing is we've been married six weeks when we started right when I started writing this <laughs> and, uh, and you kind of and you saw what it was and you and you start the thing I always say is every book is a, is I can only sketch what people will see everybody will see something different right. because it's a mm-hmm. reflection of themselves they will yes. bring things into it that i've never written the amount right. of books where someone will be angry about a scene in the book that i've that are that aren't in there mm-hmm. i had someone complain about a rape in one of my books there isn't a rape in there Mm-mm. no yeah but yeah. people start to you know embellish they mm-hmm. add, bring some of their own baggage. They bring some yeah. of their own life experience mm-hmm. to the story, and they and it adds to it. But mm-hmm. um, that probably infidelity was probably the worst thing I could have mentioned because I had someone contact my mother-in-law and mm-hmm. said, "If you put, if you draw the dots together, you can see that he's cheating." Oh and um, um, oh. who else? did it there was about about four or five people probably tried to made various accusations and things like that and and the thing of just flawed heroes that is not what people mm-hmm. wanted to write about and i've kind of my first book is now in its fourth edition and i've edited that book re-edited that book every time to sort of soften that mm-hmm. that thing yeah. because the thing mm-hmm. was was people kind of went he deserves it Mm-hmm. and yeah. you're kind of going yeah but there is a thing about redemption, redemption but, I, yeah. but, I, but I think even more so now people don't want to know about redemption it's make the mistake and you know Cancel. you're done for good yeah. 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 yeah 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 and there isn't that thing of like there is no path back and so that was a, that was a thing that I'm always very is careful of like if I am going to do someone who's flawed how do I how do I make it palatable without yes. it you know, you try not to pander to the audience, but at the same time, you know that if it's going to be a thing that's going to be a red rag, then mm-hmm. yeah, you, you, you yeah. Want, you're wasting each other's time. And the other yeah. thing is standalones. I've written mainly standalones. A series mm-hmm. would have made my life so much easier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. With I write series, and I love series, but that's only because I was writing cozies. And, you know, historical mysteries, they're almost always in a series. So I was like, well, I guess that's what I'm writing. And that's what I love to read. But, yeah, standalones, I think, can be a challenge. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm just very affected by a a subject or topic. And then you kind of like going, well, that's not going to fit into a series. Mm -hmm. Um, Although I am doing it with a couple of series things. I'm writing the third book in a series. I'm writing another third book in a series. And you're kind of like going, and I thought something the other day, and I thought, oh, I know that's kind of like spy stuff, but I can actually make that work in this series <laughs> because of what his, you yeah. know, what his job is. I kind of thought with this yeah. one, you know, he can be sort of like brought in to be this sort of um, to smuggle something across because he works internationally. Right. There you go. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But, but you, yeah, you kind standalones of, are hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because you're, you're literally finding your audience every time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I and think is- I wrote five, six standalones before I wrote anything that could be a series. Yeah. And you're smart to go, okay, I have this idea, but can I fit it in mm-hmm. to what I already have? If, yeah. You know, if it's right. possible, it may not be. So, yeah. So what is the biggest mindset change you've had to make in your career? We talked about this a little bit, but. Yeah. Um, get it-, it in writing. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm not joking. I believe it's you. The, I know. The biggest thing I've learned is that it don't. 
Um, nothing verbal. Whatever yeah. it is, back mm-hmm. it up with writing. Make sure they, whether it's email, paper, whatever, because mm-hmm. everybody can be held accountable to it being done yeah. on paper. I had the very first publisher I had was a small press. They did about 3,000 copies, uh, print run. And, mm-hmm. um, and then when, and they, they were putting out a lot of books and they started running out of money pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And it was suddenly that thing of like, oh, you need review copies? Here's a box of them. And then mm-hmm. halfway through, it was the fact that you went, okay, delete that email. And then, you know, when things started getting rough, they started um, saying, oh, review copies, you, you're buying them at retail. And they were, were deducted off of your royalty statement. So suddenly, you know, and it's like, wow. but you've got nothing. I had nothing to back it up mm, yeah. because I deleted that email saying, well, you know, I can hold you to this. Mm-hmm. Because, and you suddenly realize that I, um, um, what else have I had? There's just, you know, I wouldn't have got the stuff away from, you know, got my rights back with Dorchester. Yeah. I, you know, I did that with another publisher. Um, I knew that, you know, the, they weren't going to, uh, renew the contract and I kind of felt well the books have been out now and it's a thing of like the one breaker was something that says if um if all the books are in the shops that's that's it you know mm-hmm. rights right. revert and I was like going that's so why I made you know asked the warehouse and said have you got anything in in stock still and they went no <laughs> and I got a thing from my editor that said you know um we're not going to renew and we're not doing a, a, you know, a second printing. And I went, okay, can I have my rights back then please? <laughs> yeah. um, and it's just things like, but you've had, I did had, I've got too many horror stories. I once did a thing through an agent uh, where we were asked to develop a YA trilogy. And mm. it was done sort of like with the, don't worry. It's a done deal. Mm. And I kind of, you know, I did like a, an outline for the first book. And then it was like, can you do an outline for the trilogy? So I did an outline for the trilogy. Can you write a chapter? And it was like, can you write the first quarter of the first book? And then it was the thing of like pub board had no, had no intention of publishing this book. And it was kind of like a thing to put the editor down to remind the editor what it was. And it was like, you know, I spent three months developing all this and, you know, the editor didn't want to speak to me and, and kind of hid from the phone it's like okay i understand the situation but at least say sorry right yeah. but it was just the fact that i did not have anything in writing there was no development kind of fee or anything like that and you're like going well one i don't own this idea and two i've wasted three months on putting all this together and it's it's never going to see the light of day um there's just sort of things like just things like that that you kind of go through um I had the worst one I think in one of the heartbreaker ones was I had a handshake deal at a convention for an audiobook deal mm. me and the guy didn't know while we were talking there was a merger between oh. two of the houses oh, no. and when he got back it was told no you can't offer this contract and when I just like gone, oh, we've met. I ha- I had tickets to Indy Five Hundred. I had all this other <laughs> the stuff that was part, you know, part of this thing. And uh, I called my agent and said, it sounds like he's ready. He wants to do it. And it's like, well, we'll do it on Monday. Mm. And you know, we should have said, let's get um, an email, yeah, kind of agreement, or something, yeah, that mm-hmm. day because mm-hmm. we would have snuck in under the under the wire. But yeah. yeah, there's just so many of those stories where you're going. If I'd only had it in, in writing, writing. Yeah. <laughs> such a small um, thing, but it's such yeah. a it can have such a big impact. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you yeah. you sort of like go away from these things and go, why didn't I just bloody send some, or why didn't <laughs> they send me some? You know, it's those things that you that will you know really eat away at you for, for you know for ages yeah. afterwards mm-hmm. because it was it was so preventable, yeah. right. You yeah. know, hard breaks are hard breaks, and you kind yeah. of go, "Oh, that didn't go my way," or whatever. But it's when the you know they're self inflicted. Yes, the- <laughs> and you're like, going, "You're an yes. idiot." Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's so true. So you write uh, thrillers and mysteries under your own name and horror under a pen name. Is there anything you wish you'd known about writing under pen names? 
um, that I did it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, what I kind of went through that was a you know that held me back um, at the beginning was I would write thrillers. I'd come up through the horror world pro first. I'd mm -hmm. wrote, written a bunch of like horror and sci-fi stuff, um, mainly short stories, and I'd done a big bunch of things like that. And then I'd written my first novel, which was a thriller. Mm -hmm. And so I had that thing of like, I would go to the horror community or a convention or something. And they go, you're that thriller guy mm. and move on. And when I went uh -huh. to the, the mystery kind of world, they go, oh, you're that horror guy and move on. So you was yeah. kind of being um, ignored by both. Um, right. And you're like going, they're not that far divorced. Please love me. Yes. And, it, <laughs> yes, and the, yes. nobody was kind of listening. It was that thing of like, if I'd made the, the conscious decision right at the very beginning to say, if I'm going to write this kind of thing, it's under this name. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to write that kind of thing, it needs to be under another name because it just kind of um, would have made life uh, a lot easier. It's kind of, it is one of those kind of regretful things because I went through probably five six years of trying to convince people mm -hmm. you know depending on what room you walked into this is what you like to read and they're like going no because you're a different genre to me mm -hmm. and it's like no it isn't this is it it's just mm -hmm. you keep looking at me in a different way um so you that was one of the, that's probably the, the biggest reason why I did it and I I, I totally wish I'd done it at the start yeah. Yeah. So do you keep two separate lists and, and email list and things like that? Um, yeah, to a certain extent, you mm -hmm. kind of know who, who came from which world. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't written as much horror in the last few years compared to um, um, sort of mystery and thriller stuff, mm -hmm. but it is one of those things that I, I've got a couple of like work in progress is that I want to, um i want to you know have come out at some point that i can then um go back to that world as well okay well i think that's great advice yeah and starting a pin name is a lot of work but mm -hmm. it can it can really pay off even though it is a lot of work you know? yeah i mean it is kind of it always it is somewhat sort of like well i'm having to do everything twice yes mm -hmm. um yeah. But at the same time, I think it just makes the um, reader expectations so much simpler if you can yeah. point to it and they know you as, you know, one one yeah. or the other. Yeah, really clear definition. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think it's one of those things, it's whether it's the title, your name, the spelling of your name or yeah. whatever it is, make mm -hmm. it as easy for your, the reader to find you. Yeah, right yeah. Well, I have to ask this question because in the, in the bio, it said you were a private investigator. You've done all these different things and that was in your bio. So can you tell us, because I'm a mystery writer, I'm curious about this. Um, um, I, yeah, it was, it was me and my wife. We were kind of like um, a, a, a private duo investigators. Oh, cool. Okay, this um, sounds like a, a cozy yes. mystery. It is. It's one of those things that we, we have been asked to sort of do it. And I have I have written a couple of short stories based uh -huh. on our experiences. But what it was, we started out um, when we first got married and, and, we, and I was struggling for work and, and things like that. And we were kind of pretty close to making ends meet every month. We, uh -huh. She started uh, being a mystery shopper. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So, you know, yeah. we, we we used to live sort of like, no one say we lived um, for free, but it, you kind of did that thing that you might do at a supermarket one day mm -hmm. and you get to, you know, keep $25 of, you know, would be your limit and you would yeah. get that right. for free or reimbursed or whatever. Uh, we had a, a one-year contract with a movie theatre chain mm -hmm. that we had to go once a week. Oh, darn. <laughs> and um, we were allowed, you know, like $10 for popcorn or whatever. You had to check all that. Yeah, um, right. Plus see the movie um, every week. So we did that. And it was like a bunch of things we kind of picked and, and oh, got picked. Funny. And we did that for a while. And then they kind of like the agencies kind of say, well, can you do restaurants? Like uh -huh. quite fancy <laughs> restaurants. And we, so we were doing a lot of like these sort of like um, 
celebrity chef places. Oh, wow. You know, that you started doing in like in San Francisco and around. So you would do like, like, cause a lot of hotel chains own a bunch of these places. Mm-hmm. So you ended yeah. up doing sort of like Hyatt based things, or you might do Kempton or whatever they're Kempton or whatever they're called. And mm-hmm. so we did that for a while. And then they said, do you want to do hotels? So you would like travel somewhere for a weekend. And then it, it basically <laughs> came down to where the PI, the true PI stuff, cause you work for an agency. And as long as, someone is licensed then you're mm-hmm. okay um was it was just the thing of like do you want to be do you want to do casinos oh yeah and so we did casinos for like two or three years you were going maybe between a month or six weeks you would do either vegas or the indian casinos in mm-hmm. california mm-hmm. and you would um go there for three days you'd have like a bunch of assignments like it would be like this week you're going in you're a high roller See how much you can get away with. And, you know, we've been underneath like the MGM sign in the penthouse and stuff. And it's a thousand thousand dollar a night room. And you've got to like, I've got to get clothes that aren't from Target for this. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And you you sell them a cover story while you're there. Um, Oh, my gosh, that's so fascinating. And you're given given money to gamble. Sometimes you have to lose it to the casino, which is probably the worst thing you can ever do. (laughs) As soon as you've got to lose the money, you can't stop winning. Yes. Um, Other times it was, you know, we're giving you X amount of money. Whatever's left at the end of the the three days or whatever is is yours. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So sometimes you might come out, you know, you start playing seriously because you've got yes. to play everything from slots to like Jamaican poker or whatever yeah. the, the casino, you're playing every game. Wow. So you're like having to learn every game yeah. um, and stuff. And it's like, you might come out with your fee and um, you might come out with a couple of thousand or whatever oh my gosh. Uh, from doing that. That but, is fascinating. So, we, you know, we did all little stunts and things that you had to do. Someone told us it's like once it's like, okay, try and bribe your way into to this place. And it's like, okay, let's see. I said, how much can we use? They go 200 bucks. Um, you know, you've had to have yeah. secret meetings with the agency owner because he's known and he can't be on a camera. So there's only like two places in Vegas that he can meet you. Uh-huh. Uh, and he had just broken into Bill Clinton's private uh, donors meeting and got a picture of him with Clinton. And it's like, and dude, you're, you're such a weird little bloke. Um, <laughs> You gave us this life of intrigue to write books. Yes. Yeah, and so we, you know, there was things that we did. We once did. Um, uh, you, there's so many weird little things that you had to do. You had to come up with cover stories because some of the, the worst times they would send you to Vegas are during the dark weeks, mm. which is usually when everybody goes um, on sort of like the all the acts go away because they're refurbishing mm-hmm. the sets and yeah. all these other things. So your the worst week is usually um, between Christmas and Thanksgiving. You'll go there and you're like going to a casino and there's like seven people and they want you to go in a restaurant. They want you to monitor all this stuff and you'll walk in. You're the only ones there. Huh. And the, you know, the first job would be spend half an hour in the bar. And right. they're like going, we can seat you straight away. And it's like, no, we're going to stay in the bar yeah we're gonna, we've got someone coming <laughs> uh, we have hope for friends in. coming and you're like going oh can this and you're like going you stand out like a sore thumb and you, yes. so you try and come up with bits and pieces we had to like try and catch a guy who was pocketing money mm-hmm. from the uh, from the register and it was like how's he doing it and we think we worked out how he was doing it um but we never saw money we it was all to do with cash and crash transactions. So I short, yeah. wrote a short story about that. But yeah. um, there is a lot of things I do want to, you know, I've been asked, can you write, a, you know, cozy about husband and wife team? Yeah. That, 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 that do awesome. different ones. You know, I want to do like a cruise ship, a casino, yeah. a restaurant and things like, because we had some weird experiences in places where you kind of go, there's something going on at this place. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. And but also you... Something- you had to get yourselves out of like slightly dangerous pr- um, predicaments. We kind of had things where we would have, it's like, we think this could go sideways. If we go in this room, we can't get out. And we'd have friends who would call us in 10 minutes. We'll either tell you it's mm-hmm. fine or we're yeah. going to tell you, oh, I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, sign me up for that pin name. 
whenever yes. you, yeah. whenever that yeah, happens i want to read that yeah for sure sure for that is just amazing that's amazing so what um uh, it's been great having you here and i mean just so entertaining i think our listeners are going to get really get a lot out of this but um can you tell us what you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success has been um i think it's just have a professional mindset mm. From mm-hmm. from the beginning is I think if you go into this with oh I'm I'm just I, this is just a hobby this is just mm-hmm. a hobby mm-hmm. and you, you kind of like undersell yourself I think the main thing is if you come into this with um, because your audience doesn't know whether this is something you that is your day job your part time right. job right. your hobby it doesn't matter you have a duty to write right. um, an entertaining story and it's that thing of like you'll get yourself into more trouble if you if you don't treat it seriously Mm -hmm. and that's you know whether it's the way you speak on social media how you conduct yourself in public Mm -hmm. the way you write how you interact with your um the industry professionals whether it's agents publishers whatever is it's just that thing of going in and saying uh from and and i didn't even do this myself but it's just kind of thing of like um I'm, I have to treat this like it's a profession. And, you know, if your day job is accountant or you're a plumber or whatever, is that thing of like, you go into it with the same sort of attitude, like, yeah, this is, this is my job. And and I'm, and I'm going to put my best foot and image and everything forward. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very good advice. Yeah. Great. Well, where can people find out more about you and your books? Um, If they start at my website, which is simonwood.net. Okay. Awesome. All right. And would Great. if anyone was interested in like your workshops or seminars, would there be information about that? There's a there's a tab there? that's called okay. workshops on there, um, with you know what's coming up and um, um, date wise and things like that, and they can sign up through the the website. Okay. Perfect. That's awesome. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. This has been great. We've really enjoyed it. No, it's it's nice seeing you after. 10 12 years old it is <laughs> I know. So we went to a writers conference and met each other i think at batracon like yeah literally it, on the last the exotic, day yeah the exotic city of cleveland i believe is where yeah it. something like that <laughs> yeah. and i think i think everybody was sitting around waiting to leave yes because it was yeah. like last day and it was just kind of that sort of thing yeah, of like oh it's done. like oh you're just meeting people because you know you've got yes. Yeah, there's two the hours bar. left people left yeah. and i think yeah. alex sokoloff i think introduced yeah. us or something yeah, and, i think so yeah yeah and that was that's how it's just kind of started that's yeah. awesome so so it's been great catching up and hearing more of your story because i knew a little bit about it, but not all so that was good and we'll have all the links and everything um at wish i'd known then podcast.com and thanks to alexa larberg for editing and producing the podcast and we'll see everybody next week bye, bye. thanks Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.